Hello, everybody. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. This is Tetsu Young from Ask Tetsu. Hope everybody Hello. Doing well. Yes. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Uteli Macharibo from Ute's International Lounge. And I'm very pleased and we are very honored to have Professor Li Wei as our guest today. He's director and dean at the University College London Institute of Education, as well as chair of applied linguistics and director of the Center of Applied Linguistics. He specializes in bilingualism and multilingualism, and he studies and teaches topics such as how children acquire multiple languages simultaneously, what cognitive and social cultural impact learning multiple languages has, and how families and communities decide which language to use with whom and when. Just in a nutshell. So today's Just topic. In a nutshell. Yes. <laughs> it's so long, I think we're done. <laughs> yes. So today's topic is multi-competence and multilinguals, which should not be confused with multilingual competence. Uh, just uh, a minute here for those who, uh, who are following us. Uh, thank you, as usual, for, for, for tuning in. Uh, if you notice that uh, Rita uh, sends her apologies today, Rita, that did have a little, little something that came up. So uh, it'll be just Uta and myself, but the topic is uh, humongous. So uh, we should get in. Thank you. Yes. So as I said, the topic of today being multi-competence and multilinguals. Uh, Levi, could you please explain what multi-competence means and how it is different from multilingual competence? Yes, thank you, uh, Uta, and thank you, Tetsu. First of all, thank you very much for having me uh, at this event. I, I'm really looking forward to talking to all of you. Um, so, uh, yeah, the first thing to be said about uh, multi competence is it, it's not my concept. I love it, I use it a lot, but it's really my dear friend and colleague Vivian Cook's concept. Uh, and we, of course, did the uh, Cambridge uh, Handbook of multi, uh, li Linguistic Multi-Competence together. Now, Vivian has been developing the concept since the 1990s. In fact, his uh, um, first paper on, on this topic uh, was published in uh, Second Language Research in 1991. It's called uh, The Poverty of the Stimulus Argument and Multi-Competence. That's when he first uh, uh, propose this this uh, concept the idea of the concept multi-competence was to move away move our analytical attention away uh, from a monolingual view of the language learner the l2 learner in particular to uh, a bilingual and multilingual view of the um, l2 user so it is really about seeing l2 learning as a process of becoming bilingual, asking us the question, what is the purpose of learning a second or additional language? Is to become bilingual, multilingual, not to become another monolingual. Obviously, that's an impossibility. Um, so, and also at the same time, seeing language learning as part of language use and practice. So, so it's really moving, uh, you know, it may su seem subtle, but it's really uh, moving from uh, L2 learner to L2 to bilingual and multilingual user, language user. It's, it's uh, clearly uh, an improvement on the more system uh, uh, centered or structure centered approaches, for example, interlanguage uh, and other concepts towards a more user uh, uh, centered uh, approach. Now, multi competence is built on three uh, premises. It's really important to um, uh, remind ourselves of that. The first one, as I've just said, is multi-competence does not depend on the monolingual native speaker as the standard, as the norm, or as the target. The second thing is multi-competence concerns the total system of all languages in the single mind or in community and their interrelationships, how these different languages interact. And the third premise is that multi-competence affects the whole mind, that is all language and the cognitive systems, 
rather than language alone. And that, that's really, really important. Now, you mentioned the confusion over uh, uh, multi-competence, uh, well, between multi-competence and multilingual comp competence or competence in multiple languages. Now, multi-competence is not about uh, um, having uh, um, competence in different uh, languages. Multi-competence says that all uh, uh, speakers can be competent users of multiple languages for sure, but the analytical focus is on the interactions between the different named languages, as well as the interactions between language use and other cognitive functions. So, so, so that's really, really important. It's not looking at one language at a time, and it's not looking at language only without regard to other uh, cognitive uh, uh, functions. So the crucial point here is that uh, multi-competence starts with the bilingual and multilingual language user as the model, as the norm, as uh, you know, not as a target, not starting from a monolingual perspective and not paying lip service to bilingualism, uh, bilingualism and multilingualism while still using the monolingual native speaker as the model. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think uh, the, the most important part here uh, also is to, to move away from this concept of uh, multilinguals being more monolinguals in one. So um, yeah. what could be, could you please uh, tell us also what the consequences of this multi-competence perspective of multilinguals has on the research, for example? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. I mean, I think the the the, the social argument, if you like, um, has been made, and I think a uh, vast majority of people out there uh, do accept that. But uh, how do we translate that into our own practice as as uh, as researchers in in doing uh, research on multilingualism uh, 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 and, and bilingualism? Now. What, what is really important here is the uh, is the fact that we want to focus or uh, the concept of multi-competence urges us to focus on the interactions between the languages, not not one language only at all one language at a time, avoiding what uh, Vivian Cook called the uh, comparative fallacy, you know, comparing to monolingual native speakers. Second language learning is to become bilingual and multilingual, as I uh, said, not to become another monolingual native speaker. And we know that process is necessarily different from a monolingual acquisition of the first language. So there is no in a way, there's no point of comparing the bilingual to the monolingual as, as if the monolingual somehow sets the, 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 the standard, the, the, uh, the, the model. Uh, and we know the, the problem of uh, doing that kind of comparison will always end up as the mi bilingual, multilingual being some sort of uh, deficient or deviant kind of uh, um, uh, speaker. And also, uh, for for um, uh, research, we want to bring in other cognitive and semiotic systems into the uh, the discussion, not just narrowly uh, uh, defined linguistic aspects of uh, uh, the individual's uh, competence. Mm -hmm. So, um, and how does now the um multi-competence perspective influence or change our view how languages are or is processed in the brain mm -hmm. and uh, the language learner in, in general? Yeah, uh, again, it's a really uh, a good question. So all the languages we know, however fragmented that knowledge may be, influence the way we use language, we process language, even when we are speaking and writing in one language only. So, for example, we are processing uh, essentially an English uh, um, only uh, information right now uh, through the medium of English. But all the other languages we know individually and collectively absolutely impact on the way we process uh, information through English. There is no doubt about it, even though it's not explicitly expressed, we can't visibly see it as it were. And nobody can claim complete knowledge of any language 
this may be uh, um, a, a weird point to make, but there is a lot of assumption in, in research that somehow if you are a native monolingual speaker, you know everything about the, that language. And if you're a bilingual multilingual, you only know bits of different uh, languages. But actually, nobody can claim complete knowledge of any language, even if one claims to be a, a, a native speaker. And there is no such thing as a language-only brain area. You talked, you, you asked about, you know, how a uh, language is, is, is processed in, in the brain. Now, the neural networks responsible for language processing are, proce are for processing all languages. Different, lang different named languages are not represented or stored in different parts of the brain. You know? uh, and th th that's, that's one point. And the other point is the, the, the brain area for language is also responsible for other cognitive functionings like memory, attention, even emotion. That's one of the reasons why there is uh, such an increase uh, of interest in emotion and language learning in, in recent years. And the third point is that language use is a multimodal uh, process. So we have hand gesture, body posture, facial expression, all that, that really go very naturally uh, and uh, in an uh, integral way with language uh, uh, expression. So uh, all these are part of the consideration of multi-competence. Oh, this is... Really interesting uh, way of looking at language. I I, I don't think I've ever uh, thought of it this way. Even the secondary, how would I say, processes that you mentioned, like like I'm I'm moving my hands exactly. right now. Yes. It's part yes. of language. It, it's it's absolutely fascinating when we think of it this way. It, it, would it be fair if I say I'm already branching off? I told you I wasn't going to branch off too too much, but <laughs> I'm already branching off. But would it be fair to say it's kind of like sports? uh you're you're practicing sports but if you practice different sports it's like speaking different languages you you are doing this the one category that's called sports but uh the different skills involved in different skill, uh, sports uh, yeah absolutely an yeah, analogy? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, there are transferable uh, uh, skills clearly from, from one language uh, mm -hmm. to another. Uh, the, the, the process of learning uh, and uh, acquiring this, uh, the, the skills are uh, very, very similar in many ways. Uh, and just like uh, uh, sports that you said, but also, you know, we quite often use the metaphor of, uh, of music or the allergy of music. Ah, uh, I should have gone there. Of, uh, <laughs> music so music making meaning making you we we, we do it in a coordinated uh, way through different means especially in orchestral music we listen to different instruments together not one uh, at a time you don't mm. do that uh, well you know you, you end up with a with a different piece of music if you just uh, have one instrument at a time obviously um so uh, yeah the, 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 you know like what you were just doing you know if you if you just said what you said without the hand gestures it's a totally different meaning it's a different way of communicating um and we have that natural instinct to process this information uh, uh in the co coordinated orchestrated way and that's that's the aspect of human communication language uh, use that the concept of multi competence really wants to highlight well yes uh, and yeah Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I, 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 it's kind of like opening a can of worms, <laughs> but it's a nice can of nice, delicious <laughs> can of worms. Because <laughs> when we say 70% of communication is, is, is gestural, uh, it's, it's just amazing how that works across uh, different cultures. Yeah. Uh, it, it, uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. and they they all they all cultural, historical, and uh, absolutely context bound. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, I think in 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 traditional uh, ways of doing uh, linguistic research, we tend to have this artificial uh, uh, division between what is linguistic, which is, what is regarded as linguistic, mm -hmm. paralinguistic, non-linguistic. Now, from from the multi competence uh, perspective. 
that those divisions really don't make any sense. As I said already, you know, in 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 real communication through language, now gest gesture, facial expression, intonation, body posture, they they really absolutely have to go with uh, the yeah. message we were you know we, we we're sending out. And if we um, uh, alter any aspects of it, you have a different uh, uh, gesture or different facial expression. It will be a different uh, uh, language. The, the, you know, it will be a different message uh, you're trying to get across. I, I do yeah. feel with this. Uh, I'm sorry, Uta, this is the last one. Last one. I'm gonna. <laughs> but it, it, it's just it's all stirring in my mind right now because what you mentioned earlier is is it just sort of adds to the arsenal of things that I can say to parents when they when they when they tell me things like kids should learn one language at a time. You know, you yeah. should become perfect in one language before you go to the next one and things like that. And 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 what you're saying, it really completely sort of breaks that down. Uh, for, for me, it, it's kind of nonsense to to try to achieve perfection in one or or when when they are raising kids in you know bilingually in this city, they want to achieve you know uh, whether it's reading skills and writing skills, everything to perfection. Which is that that word perfection really makes zero sense since even yeah. modern rivals cannot well, there's so many yeah. natural cases uh you know from from bilingual multilingual families that kids uh, you know grow up in the uh, and a multilingual environment where parents and children uh, uh, switch between different languages uh, uh, naturally and fluidly um, uh, without kind of uh, seemingly paying any attention to any of the languages. It, it, it's absolutely natural and uh, there is absolutely no Difficulty encountered by by the kids. Uh, uh, it's quite the reverse. When you insist on a mon monolingual policy at home, that's when problems start to have. You know, if you insist on just speak one language at a time, actually kids can't. You know, find it quite challenging to do, and then it leads to uh, uh, problems. So, so I think these. Um, kind of artificial, uh, in, uh, the imposition of certain monolingual policies and ideologies on, 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 on children especially, uh, really can be quite detrimental to language development of bilingual children. No. Absolutely. And um, I think this kind of approach that actually makes sense. We're talking about multilinguals, it should have a multi-something approach. Yes. So um, by illustrating the different facets that are all involved in, in the end, in communication. Of course, we use language, we use signs, we use non-verbal communication in order to get our thoughts or what we want to say across. So in uh, many multilingual families, we also have some, some gestures that mean completely something different. And um, I was recently also talking about like the, the, the code switching, <laughs> where you use one gesture, you mean it in one language, language you turn to the next one use the other gesture that makes means exactly the the opposite and there is where you you realize that it's not only about language it's about so much much more than than only the words and the grammar or uh, being able to say a sentence in a grammatically correct way so like you said uh, Tetsu and like we said before there is no such thing as perfection no one will ever be perfect in any language and i know that uh, many parents who, who yeah aim for that uh, are first shocked when you say that right <laughs> because yeah. they say well but i mean i've studied i don't know maybe 10 years this language so i should be at some point and then you get some kind of uh, gradings and you say you are C1 or C2 and you write uh, articles but still you're still learning so um i would like to uh, mention one of the many myths that come with being multilingual and that has a little bit to do with this as we were talking also about the metaphor of music right when you say okay when um parents are advised or they think they worry that too many languages are too many for the children and they are advised to maybe uh, skip a language or focus on one 
especially mm -hmm. when the children start attending school. This is very often mm -hmm. the case that then they switch to the other language. I, I know that I did the same, although we uh, maintained the other languages. But then comes this metaphor, right, with the music. Will my child who plays, I don't know, the flute and the piano play better piano if I tell mm -hmm. him or her to not play the flute? Uh, and I, I've heard it many times and I hear also some parents asking then, yes, but then my child, if I tell my child to not play the flute, my child will have more time to play the piano and so yeah. practice more and become better. Mm -hmm. So it's always shifting back and forth between this focusing on one at some point and focusing on both. And I think maybe there is a message that we, we can maybe, um, yeah, Tell explicitly. Yeah, I, 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 again, I think this this is the kind of uh, one uh, uh, at a time kind of uh, ideology. I mean, certainly yeah. in 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 uh, language practice, uh, that is uh, still very uh, um, influential in many ways. Now, uh, um, it, it's really. Um, uh, related to uh, the question you know, how how parents can take advantage uh, of uh, the fact that you know they are bilingual and multilingual uh, while balancing the the, the risks of, of children developing uh, any kind of resistance uh, I guess towards any of the languages now our, our research uh, with the um, ethnic minority and immigrant communities uh, in Britain for example, have consistently uh, uh, shown that parents really want to maintain their ethnic uh, uh, languages at home. So I don't think the, the, the parents from immigrant or, or uh, as a minority uh, background naturally want their children to, to switch to the majority language or use a lot of the majority language, certainly not in the, in the home context. But the schools and societal policies and practices um, that uh, discourage bilingualism and uh, multilingualism uh, will be filtered through to the home context, there is no doubt about it. So some parents are uh, uh, concerned that their children may not do uh, as well as their uh, um, mono, uh, monolingual native speaking uh, uh, children uh, in, in school if they used their ethnic languages uh, uh, too much either at home or at school. Now, I can absolutely see the political and cultural reasons for these concerns. But there is no scientific evidence. That, that's the thing I want to really emphasize. There is no scientific evidence to show that knowing and using uh, as minority languages in particular, or different languages at home or even at school contributes negatively to the, to the children's learning or their school uh, attainment. Uh, where there are cases uh, um, of uh, ethnic minority children not doing as well as their uh, majority peers in school uh, work, it is often uh, than not the socio-economic and political factors rather than their knowledge of other languages, especially of ethnic minority languages, that are the real cause. And we have to be very clear uh, uh, about that. And of course, in, in, in the um, uh, school uh, kind of education context, the, the role of L1 in second language learning has been debated for generations. And in fact, this is what multi-competence as a concept initially wanted to address. And there's plenty of evidence of the positive effects of using one's uh, um, first language in second language learning, uh, and also the, um, uh, the, 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 the benefit of maximizing one's bilingual, multilingual uh, capacity in learning. Yes. Absolutely, that's uh, fantastic, thank you. Um, and I would like maybe to add something for those parents who are worried. I mean, we are at the end of the school year and many parents are, are considering maybe to, to sign up their children in a school that is an additional language for their home languages, uh, that there are always phases where maybe one language is, is more dominant anyways, yeah? And where you focus on fostering the skills in that language, but it doesn't mean that the other ones need to be neglected for a longer time or, yeah, longer period. I would like to come back to the multi 
competence challenge that challenges the monolingual native speaker norm. Um, and could you maybe illustrate how these consequences uh, that this can have or will have on the policies, ideologies and yeah. others? Uh, again, thank you for that really good question. I mean, the idea of um, uh, the monolingual native speaker has been challenged by lots of people and from very different uh, uh, perspectives as well, not just uh, uh, from from the multi-competence uh, uh, perspective. It is rather curious uh, that the native speaker is usually uh, assumed to be a monolingual yeah um so when we talk about uh, uh a native speaker quite often it is assumed to be a monolingual and also of the ethnic majority in a given society and, and community so for instance we, we have literally thousands of children uh, born and brought up in in britain of immigrant and ethnic minority backgrounds including european uh, backgrounds but also uh, you know asian uh, backgrounds they have never had a monolingual experience they have uh, grown up as bilinguals and multilinguals and one of their languages is english um, but often they are not treated as native speakers of English because they are not monolingual and they are not of the ethnic majority. majority. That's why we need to challenge this concept of, of uh, the native speaker. Now, uh, multi competence is, is more than more more about challenge challenging the completeness-based uh, models, as I uh, uh, previously mentioned. The, the, this completely completeness-based models of linguistic competence. The monolingual native speaker is somehow I idealized or even idolized as uh, uh, having a complete knowledge of their native language. Multi-competence questions that. In fact, the vast majority of the world's population know bits of multiple different languages that we use together in everyday uh, uh, communication. So multi-competence is not about how much one knows of any specific language, but how language users make the best use of what they know of elements of different languages to communicate multilingually as well as multimodally. You know, as a result, the uh, language users who have acquired knowledge of a second or third language later in life, uh, whose knowledge of the, of the languages they have acquired later in life may be somewhat restricted or limited, uh, are all considered as competent language users in social interaction without privileging the monolingual racial majority as native speaker. Yes, so um, if I see it right, I mean, coming back to this fact that many parents are signing up their children for a school and they have to fill in the form, what is your mother tongue or what is the first language, and they can only fill in one <laughs> spot. Yeah. And they are not able to, and, and they are asked actually to decide. I mean, it's like deciding which child you like most among <laughs> your four children, Tetsu, for example. Yeah. This is simply we, we not had possible. A recent we had yeah. a recent example in the in in, in the latest uh, uh, census uh, in Great Britain that uh, you know you can only have you can only name one language at a time when you when, when you describe your main language at home. Now, lots of people have complained. You, if you see the social media reactions, it's really interesting. Lots of people uh, complained about it uh, and say, well, you know, we don't have just one main language. We always use two or more languages at home. That th Those are bilingualism, multilingualism, are our no, no, normal practice and are our main languages. So, uh, but of course that, you know, um, an institution like a national census does not recognize that. And that again, that's something that we all have to uh, um, challenge and fight against, as it were, in terms of policy and you know these uh, impositions of uh, monolingual ideologies. Yes, absolutely, and uh, I think 
somehow the more pressure comes from multiple sides again multiple <laughs> uh, yeah. the the more maybe changes will happen i mean we are we're waiting for this shift to happen since since a long time and um my children are now well all teenagers and and left school already and so I, I still wait for this moment to happen, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it takes some time, especially if then you think about worldwide, right? Not only in the UK, but uh, of course also in other countries where there are some tendencies. I know that some uh, schools that I know here in the Netherlands, they have more spots for the languages at home. So you can say, okay, we speak German and Italian and French and the school language is Dutch or uh, English. Uh, but the whole system then uh, has a problem with assigning them then okay then in the german class you are among the native speakers um, or among not the native speakers which is an uh, an additional problem for those who grow up with uh, multiple languages abroad so they don't grow up in a system or in a society where this language is spoken so they very often um don't score as high if there is made any comparison with children who um, are schooled in that language in the country where the language is spoken and so they still have something to catch up or they they don't feel at the same level of fluency i mean tetsu you uh, go to japan and your children go to japan every every year in order to be fully immersed and to uh, attend school there um, maybe you can share a bit about what what that makes to your children and what your intention is. Well, is so we Sorry. moved in Quebec or outside, just right outside of Montreal for about eight months of the year. That's September to April. And then we come to Japan, where I am right now uh, in Nagasaki, and the kids go to lo the local school uh, right here. Usually that first week or two is is that adjustment period where they're like oh the kanjis are so hard because they go to the year the, their age standardized year school year so it's it's relatively tough that first few weeks but they are uh, very adaptive uh it's, that's really something that the teachers always tell us you now the kids uh, i mean i tell the teachers don't worry about grades uh just uh, what's most important for us is that they integrate socially into into the, the the their little society the, the the kids society and have friends and that's much more important than us but if we look at academically speaking they're do, they're doing okay i mean they're they're eight months or six to eight months uh, behind when they come here but they integrate very quickly and they, they quickly you know go from 30 40 points uh, in, a, in a test to go up to 90 100 uh you know consistently uh, and they don't seem to struggle socially uh, for now knock on wood uh, so, so at least for us that that's what we're going for uh and um I, you know the, this use of multi-competence i'm sure you know they 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 are using more than just the japanese language it's it's the culture it's the it's the the the, the living the living itself the living and breathing of japan yeah. I think um, bilinguals and multilingual language users are very resilient and very adaptive, yes. uh, 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 as you say. I think the uh, assessment regime uh, does need to catch up with, you know, our understanding of bilingualism, multilingualism. Uh, more often uh, than not, the uh, assessment testing regime still is very much monolingual. Uh, uh, based mm -hmm. and it's one language at uh, at a time does not show the full competence uh, mm -hmm. and full potential of bilinguals and la uh, and multi multilingual language users. I, I think that is something that really we have to tackle at some point. Yes, I, I'm so happy to, to 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 hear you talk and have this session today because it's 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 really opened my mind to myself, sort of how I looked at things. I just never really sort of defined it as such but uh how i i've been looking at it is uh, this through this multi competence uh spectrum i think the way i i've been looking at it so so thank you for that um my kids they are born into it so yeah. uh, you know this is this is normal for for them and it is the norm for 
a lots of people like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, but if I do play the the devil's advocate, sort of so to speak, from a policy perspective, from a structural perspective, it's easier, of course, to to categorize and put them into like a monolingual, the, the strongest yeah. language, so to speak, and assess that through that spread to the other languages if necessary if applicable or whatever it is but this assessment perspective yes I, I i can i can see that it's much much easier it's more clean i guess to to use one language and, and call that the the norm yes it is but uh, somehow especially when when our children grow up in an environment in the home language in the home situation where all the languages are welcomed and are fostered and are supported and then uh, they start getting out in the world and they see some kind of resistance of the world towards yeah accepting that they are multilingual that they have different competences and they are um, perfectly capable of functioning in different settings <laughs> in yeah. these languages uh, there seems to be like this this gap in between that needs somehow to be filled or to be bridged between the two, uh, that is, uh, it's highly, yeah. I, may I um, sh just share one comment from Josie, uh, mm -hmm. who was, um, I think it was a few minutes ago when we were talking about this, but it's still actually, uh, if you put another language spoken, this is uh, re with um, regards to filling in the forms at school. If you put another language spoken at home, the school assumes you cannot speak English or the school language, I think she means. Yes. So uh, that is something that I observe very often when uh, parents and tell me, yeah, which language should we do? Because if I put German, then they think they cannot speak Italian. Or mm -hmm. if I don't tell them that we also speak the school language, then they treat my child as a child that cannot speak the school language. So it is a real struggle. <laughs> it, it is not easy. Yes. It's and not easy and at all. In, in, in England, uh, there is this label EAL, English as an yeah. additional language. So if you're labeled uh, EAL, it doesn't really matter whether you were born and grew up in this country and speaking English as one of your many uh, languages, but for, as a, one of many of your first language and absolutely no problem with English, you still kind of regard it as some, somehow different. But I guess what we're trying to, uh, to uh, argue is that, you know, the difference is an asset, really. It, 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 it does not affect their linguistic competence. It does not affect their, or shouldn't be affecting their uh, learning in any negative way. Obviously, uh, we need to get uh, the schools and the education system to recognize that difference and regard that difference as an asset um, and, and the U, uh, EAL label should be regarded as a badge of honor rather than some sort of deficiency uh, but that really uh, is about the uh, structural uh, uh, biases and, and, and discrimination and inequalities is really in the system uh, itself rather than the, the actual uh, abilities and, and proficiencies of, of the individual language users. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's very much a socio-political thing that we have to uh, uh, address. Yes. And no, no, I was going to say, just, just <laughs> again, just the same comment. It's sort of a, a self-imposed way of, <laughs> of, of restricting ourselves uh, in, in a way. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in the United States, it's still uh, the case in, in, in many places where if you uh, describe somebody as a bilingual learner in, in school, then it's actually seen as a bit of an issue, a bit of a problem. You know, they, they need uh, remedial uh, uh, support. Um, they, they rather than say, well, oh, wow, that's wonderful. You know, you know, you know more than one language. You must be more advanced and, you know, than than most other people. No. <laughs> Yes, I, I remember times where uh, my children also had uh, English as additional language and where uh, people were thinking, OK, they they have they need their special need children. And I had to explain to them that there is a difference and please don't be disrespectful to either parts. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's it's really a problem in, in the mind of people. But what I wanted to add is that uh, I observe that many uh, schools, I mean, if a child starts, let's say, in the first uh, grade with as EAL student, 
they can progress and become more natively like students, right? Because they achieve that same level as their, their peers and the, the native speakers, we are back to this. <laughs> but um, what I observe across many international schools, some um, do adapt then and, and let the children become part of the group and others keep them as additional learners for a very long time, which can affect also, but this is another topic, can affect their, their self-confidence in that language. I mean, they are exposed maybe uh, three, four years less than their monolingual or native speakers, but they are still um, achieving the same results and sometimes even more than, uh, than them. But I think it's a it's a general problem. I would like to share another question if you if you allow me. It's from Fathi. Hello. Since languages are interdependent, one problem is first political: how to convince politicians and LEPP makers to teach them at the same time, and hence coordinate efforts. And second is what strategies of teaching to apply in the classroom. Thanks for the nice exchange. Thank you for the question, Fathi. Yeah. Um it's absolutely right you know, you're emphasizing that languages are interdependent and and the the, the problem is ideological and it's policy uh, driven and it's it, it, it's political now how to convince politicians and policymakers that's a tough job i i i uh, probably wouldn't start uh, uh, there uh, I would uh, prefer to start with with practitioners, with, with uh, uh, professionals, especially teachers, but also parents who really have to deal with uh, 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 bilingual and multilingual learning on an everyday basis. And I think long term we will be able to influence the thinking if if the um, uh, community and society's attitudes towards bilingualism and multilingualism have fundamentally changed. And if society values bilingualism, multilingualism, also recognize this a real message for the nation. It's a resource for, 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 for the nation. It's, you know, the multilingual capacity for any country, I think it's so important. Uh, for the economy and everything else, uh, then I think policies will follow. I, th I don't think the uh, you know politicians are actually there uh, to lead uh, um, a social change in, in in any positive way. I'm afraid, uh, so, you know, they they tend to follow the uh, kind of uh, uh, social trends. And once the, the communities recognize the values of bilingualism, multilingualism, it is hopeful that some of the policies will change. And will follow uh, uh, th that social change from grassroots. As yes. it were. Uh, I, I think you know. So, so really, the the, the challenge is to change uh, the social attitudes uh, and how we perceive uh, the value or lack of it of bilingualism. Yes, I I would like to add a comment from Yoshito, who is a teacher in uh, England that um, exactly says what, what you just uh, mentioned. And uh, he says, and I can see that the child's level of English affects or influences every other judgment made on, on the student, whether it is target grades or ability settings. Luckily, teachers also have their say on the actual ability of, ch of the child. And I think this emphasizes the, the power of the teacher <laughs> who knows yeah. how to um, Yes, how to assess the child on not only the language, but on all the other skills coming back to the topic of today. Exactly. No, I mean, there, there are so many uh, teachers. I have the highest respect for, for teachers who really, really know their pupils very well. And we have to value their views and, uh, and, and trust their judgment. Um, when, when these uh, uh, teachers value and they i mean you know depending on the uh, teacher training regime uh, uh, many of our teachers um, certainly uh, trained in the ucl institute of education are very much aware of the values of bilingualism multilingualism because we we, we provide them with good uh, uh, training in, in on those topics uh, they, they really uh, see uh, children having different languages as a very positive thing 
So they will be very creative and find ways of uh, um, uh, assessing the children um, so that they can they, their best ability in in terms of uh, using different languages will be reviewed through uh, these uh, uh, school-based uh, uh, assessment. So the, you know there are ways uh, of, of really showing what uh, bilingual children, uh, multilingual children can do, in addition to what monolingual children can. So you know they can show the, the, the real advantages of of uh, being bilingual, and multilingual. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's uh, th thank you for all the fantastic questions and comments from the audience. We do want to acknowledge everybody here. Thank you for watching on thank Facebook you. Live and on YouTube Live. So it's again. As usual, it's become very interactive, but we do need to get back on track. <laughs> I will uh, uh, maybe go ahead with the next question that we have for you. Um, it's uh, we're going to sort of shift away from the school um, environment, the the policies and whatnot, and come back to this the, the little uh, discussion that we had about how L1 and L2 they sort of complement each other, they sort of support each other, they grow together uh, and uh, I don't know if we really discussed this a little today but uh, if we allow the kids at school to use their L2 uh, and their home languages um, that is perceived as a, a, a beneficial for the children but if are we able to bring that back home in the home setting and take advantage of that like how would parents uh, be able to sort of take this this knowledge, this understanding, and apply it at home while at the same time, this is something that comes up a lot. Like if we allow the kids to speak two languages, three languages at the same time, they sort of just go with the majority language and resist their their, their, their home language or target language. So here's a juggling act for the parents. It's, it's a pretty yeah, complex absolutely. question. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, think? I guess I, I, I kind of uh, touch upon this already uh, because I don't see any real evidence that uh, somehow bilingual uh, parents, multilingual parents, uh, in the home context actually uh, discourage uh, um, their children from uh, using uh, all their languages. In fact, there is plenty of evidence uh, that um, they they want to uh, encourage the children from uh, to to use all their languages in the home context, and that's only the, a good thing. Now, yeah. uh, 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 of course, uh, there is the socio political issue of different uh, uh, languages having different social status. Yeah, some uh, immigrant languages, especially non-European languages in the European context, are uh, not valued by society, and therefore, mm -hmm. they're, they're, uh, the, the parents are slightly concerned about um, their children using uh, those languages, uh, how that would be perceived by uh, the majority outside the home context. So they might uh, uh, say to the children, you know, you have to be really, really good at the uh, society's uh, majority language uh, uh, first. Although uh, at the same time, I think the majority of uh, these ethnic minority uh, uh, parents still want to uh, keep the home as the main site for uh, the maintenance of the home language. So it is a constant battle and it is a political mm -hmm. ideological battle, unfortunately. They have to, I mean, you know, uh, all uh, immigrant um, as minority families are aware of the uh, their, their position in society and the social attitudes and the policies towards them. And different communities may uh, have very different status in different uh, uh, countries. So uh, 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 again, it's it is you're, you're absolutely right. It is a it is a careful balancing act. Um, uh, during COVID, for example, uh, lots of ethnic minority uh, families in uh, uh, Britain, at least, uh, are worried about the invasion or the perceived invasion of English uh, in their home context because you know they they wanted to reserve the home uh, context for their home language because that's the only chance their their children will be able to 
to learn and develop uh, these ethnic minority languages because at, at school they won't be able to to use their home language they, they can only uh, uh, speak english now you know they're home being homeschooled or they spend most of the time at home and you you hear them speaking english all the time so it, it again it's another kind of battle the how to balance between the different languages and different uh, uh, contexts i think again you know schools have a lot uh, to do to make sure that they value uh, um, uh, children's uh, um, multi uh, competence and the fact that they know other languages or languages other than English or, or other than the school language um, and encourage them to actually make uh, good use of uh, that knowledge in the learning as well as in everyday social communication. Yes. Right. Um, talking about this um yeah, use of both languages, and I, I'm sorry I go back and forth between home and, and school here, but Fathi has yeah. this uh, comment, uh, Professor Li Wei, what do you think of Larissa Aronin's concept of dominant language constellations as an approach to deal with the intractable problem of multilingualism? And how is it similar to and or different from your own concept, translanguaging the one you coined with, Ophelia? Thanks, Professor, for uh, your research has changed my life. So. <laughs> I love that last uh, uh, thank you. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the, the concept. In fact, I wrote um, a commentary on their latest book um, uh, on dominant language uh, constellation. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, concept looking at the uh, uh, um, interactions uh, of different languages, but also looking at the power relations and how uh, different languages are, are clustered together in different societies. I think that's a, uh, that's a really uh, powerful kind of uh, um, approach and a really interesting angle uh, on uh, multilingualism. Um, uh, translanguaging is rather different from from all of these. Uh, translanguaging in, in, in a way takes um, one step further in challenging um, some of uh, some aspects of the idea of multilingualism. Okay, we've been talking about multilingualism uh, quite a lot today, but actually, translanguaging uh, the trans bit is not about multi. So, you know, there is a kind of assumption in the concept of multilingualism, and th somehow these different languages um, uh, coexist side by side. Translanguaging is is not about that. Translanguaging is about breaking those artificial boundaries between named languages and also breaking the hierarchies between the different uh, uh, named languages really, really want to uh, uh, um, uh, challenge the, uh, the, the hierarchies between the different languages. Obviously, translanguaging is also about uh, um, breaking the boundaries between language and other cognitive and semiotic systems. And I've written about that in, in, in our handbook, uh, the handbook that I did with Vivian Cook on uh, uh, linguistic multi-competence. So, uh, multi-competence and uh, translanguaging are very closely uh, connected, but translanguaging is more about breaking those boundaries and uh, um, transcending uh, the divisions, the dichotomies, and uh, you know uh, the differences between named languages and also between language and other cognitive systems. Yes, and I think uh, it would be um, very bad. We have only a few minutes, and I think uh, the, the topic of translanguaging uh, merits much more time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we might come back to you and ask you maybe to, to explain a bit more about this. But um, I would like to, to come back to uh, the multi-competent language user that you mentioned at the beginning. And maybe as a, as a closing, at least for me, then uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to share other questions and also Tetsu, please uh, ask more questions. But can you maybe describe a multi-competent language user? Mm. So to me, a multi—excuse <laughs> me—to be a multi-competence language user is, is someone who knows which language is to use, to whom, when, how, and why. Uh, you mentioned this question is a kind of extended uh, um, uh, formula from uh, Fishman's uh, uh, formulation. 
and to do so uh, multimodally across different models and across the boundaries between named languages. That's what uh, a multi-competent language user is about. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> it gives me gives us all more ideas of what we are aiming for <laughs> and valuing. Tetsu, do we have other questions or would you like to add something? No, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to be a wrap pretty soon. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Li Wei, for such a, a, an engaging session. Uh, it, it's mind-blowing. I think uh, I've seen the word translanguaging many times before, and, I've, and I've, I've searched that wiki page many, many times before. But it's really the first time that I feel that I've uh, grasped the notion uh, by, by doing some research on, on you before this session and, and through the discussion today. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Uh, as Fatih mentioned earlier, uh, your research is touching lives uh, and, and really uh, making a big difference uh, in our community. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yoshito, well, thank just... you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to talk to you both. And I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions. If anybody wants to contact me directly mm -hmm. through email, that's absolutely fine. Oh, that's very kind of you. We will share uh, all the references that we mentioned today in the description on YouTube and maybe also on Facebook. And if anyone has further questions, please share in the comments. We are going to check and, and yes, uh, Professor Li Wei is also going to follow it or we will inform him if there are any further questions about the topic. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm who participated today and thank you so, so much for your time. I know that it's a, it's a period that is very intense. <laughs> you just uh, <laughs> became Dean and you have so much on your plate, <laughs> but we are very thankful. Everyone is very thankful for, for all the work that you and your, your teams with the S plural are doing. <laughs> thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. So we will now have to look forward uh, to the next session. Let me put up uh, the my little banner for our next session. Okay, so uh, those of you who have been following us know that uh, we have been doing Raising Multilinguals Live for one full year now. And this is a fantastic way to kick off our second year with Professor Li Wei. It was an, uh, a phenomenal session. I'm sure you would all agree. Uh, next session. So we have been having all uh, lots of experts you know frontline experts uh, on the the in the world of raising multilingual children but now uh next session we would like to bring on the actual recipients of uh everything that we're doing all the efforts uh, and all the parents read right here uh all all the efforts that we address to are these are for our kids so we're going to talk to some young adults who were raised uh, bilingually multilingually and get their take on everything that we've been doing for them. Is this something that you know they appreciate? Uh, what has been working? What has not been working? So we'll get it straight from the source next time with the young adults. Okay, so that's coming up in two weeks, uh, July twentieth, same time, uh, same channel. So we do look forward to seeing everybody uh, in two weeks. Oh, I think we. Uh, we, we, we lost uh, uh, Professor Li Wei. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the session today on Facebook and on YouTube Live. And we will be seeing you again in two weeks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tot de volgende keer. A la próxima. Right. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Doei.